Welcome. We're going to get started in about a minute. For those of you who have just joined us, we are recording this and it will be posted to the DIR website at a later date. We're using the chat to find out who's new to this process. And it looks like we do have uh, quite a few that are participating in the IRDR for the first time. So Great. Um, we've got a, a lot of good information uh, to provide today, and I hope uh, we can answer any and all the questions that you might have. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Mark, will you switch to the next slide and we'll do some introductions and go over the agenda? Great. So welcome. You are attending the DIR's webinar that's covering the 2022 Information Resources Deployment Review, or IRDR. Um, it looks like this isn't uh, the first round for uh, some of you, but we do have several uh, new IRMs or uh, maybe people who are in different roles or at a different agency. Um, so we're going to cover a bit of background about the IRDR, kind of who's required to do it, what DIR's role is in it, uh, what the sources of data are, how the data is used, key dates. We'll provide an overview, a high-level overview of the four parts of the IRDR. And then we're going to provide a demonstration of the spectrum data collection tool, uh, which is used for completing the requirements for this important biennial review that is known as the IRDR. So I'm Elizabeth Cooper. I'm the Director of Technology Planning Policy and Governance here at DIR. I'm in the Chief Technology Office reporting to John Hoffman. Um, the IRDR is a key component of the planning and reporting responsibilities under my office, and I'm going to serve as your host today. Um, I'd like to have the other speakers um, introduce themselves, and then we're going to turn off our cameras while we're running the presentation. Tessa, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tessa Lopez, and I am a senior policy analyst uh, with DIR. I also work in the technology planning and policy office within the chief technology office at DIR. And a lot of the work that I do is uh, related to legislative reporting. A lot of the big reports that I work on, um, of course, are the state strategic plan, which is uh, closely tied to this IRDR. So um, I'm glad to have everybody here today and I'm uh, ready and, and willing to provide any and all the information that I can to help you along through this process. Great, thank you. Keith, you want to tell people a little bit about yourself? Absolutely, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, my name is Keith Chenoweth. I am here this morning representing the Office of the Chief uh, Information Security Officer. Um, our uh, role in the IRDR is that we uh, interpreted the, uh, the statutory requirements, built the tool that uh, you answer the, the questionnaire and the inventory in, uh, formatted those questions and are here to provide guidance on uh, uh, any questions that you have um, regarding uh, meeting those statutory requirements. Thank you so much, Keith. And is Rain online? Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Rain Jarostic. I am a senior consultant with uh, DIR, specifically in regards to the Spectrum Portal. So anything related to the state um, Archer or Spectrum portal, I kind of work on, deploy, manage, operate. So I'll be conducting the demo today and serve as your support during the process as it relates to entering IRDR and completing IR caps in Spectrum. So, okay. Great. Um, thank you, Tessa, Keith, and Rain, for those introductions. I also want to mention we have several um, other DIR folks online today. Uh, there are subject matter experts. Uh, Matt Kelly, he's the Deputy Chief Information Security Officer for Security Policy and Governance. And Marie Cohen is our Statewide Digital Accessibility Program Administrator. 
Mark Leavenworth is our IRM Education and Outreach Coordinator, and Robert Benajam is with Enterprise Solution Services, and they'll be helping out in the background and may help us uh, field the questions that are in the Q&A. So be sure and um, throw questions in the Q&A, um, not the chat, in the Q&A while we're uh, going through the presentation, and we'll be sure and get to those. Um, and uh, now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the background of the IRDR. So each information security manager or IRM for state agencies in higher education are required to conduct an information resources deployment review every two years. So this is your opportunity to assess the current state of IT in your organization. We know you do that on a regular basis, but this is really just kind of a, a pause, a snapshot in time um, where you can take a full look at the current state of IT in your organization. Um, you can use the results to communicate your progress to your leadership, uh, make plans for modernization, or uh, prepare for funding that you may need to request in your legislative rep appropriations request. Um, you received instructions. They are also uh, posted on DIR's website. Um, so we sent those instructions out in December. And the statutory requirements for the IRDR are found on page four of those instructions in the key information section. section. Um, state agencies must submit the results of this review to DIR. Uh, through the IRDR data collection tool and spectrum by March 31st, 2022. Now, higher education is required to conduct the review, but there are only certain items that they are required to report to DIR. We do encourage you, um, if you're with higher ed, to uh, look at the spectrum tool and, and think about using it and completing the entire IRDR that you're already conducting um, in that review because it is a, a helpful collection tool. Um, but as noted in the instructions, higher education is really uh, required to conduct an electronic information resources accessibility survey which is found in the IRDR sections on section 1.03, 2.02, and uh, 2.03. And, and those results must be submitted in the spectrum portal. Um, DIR uses the information from the IRDR um, for uh, looking at compliance, reviewing um, services, planning for things that we can do better to better support you and uh, for reports to the legislature. Next slide, please. So um, this is a diagram about kind of the data inputs and the reporting overview of the IRDR. But if you look in the middle box of this diagram, you'll see the components of the IRDR. Um, so it's made up of a questionnaire. Um, and that questionnaire includes um, questions about the IT environment, and this covers everything from uh, general information about roles, your hardware and your software, cybersecurity, digital services, data management, training needs, etc. Um, it also includes a section about compliance and um, also a third section on how much progress uh, we're making and how well agencies are aligned with statewide strategic goals. Um, then it also includes um, in that middle box on the right hand side of that middle box is an inventory and this is where agencies report on their devices and applications. Now for this inventory we pre populate as many of the questions as possible with previous answers uh, from IRDR and sources uh, like the CMDB and ServiceNow. Um, but it's really important for all IRMs to review and update the information for the IRDR, um, which is located in the Spectrum portal. Um, so when you uh, go into the Spectrum portal, it may look like you're 40% of the way complete, but really those are just um, pre-populated questions to help you a little bit with the heavy lifting. And um, it's really important to thoroughly review all of that information to make sure um, it's accurate. And we'll tell you a little bit more, um, and Keith will touch on this when we talk about the um, inventory section um, in this presentation. 
Um, now, as I previously mentioned, the results, um, they provide you, agencies, higher education, with key information about the state of your IT environment and how well you're complying with IT standards and your alignment with strategic goals. Um, that it also helps you prepare um, if you're going to be doing any assessment of your portfolio of applications, um, understanding your progress and improvements that may be needed. Um, also preparing for the uh, cybersecurity and legacy systems uh, review or the PCLS. Um, so this is uh, some prep work that's important. Um, DIR will use this information, as um, we mentioned previously, uh, for reports that are due to the legislature. And this follows a uh, biennial planning and reporting cycle. And so this IRDR is a key source of input uh, for that statewide planning, collaboration, and advocation that we at DIR do uh, to accelerate digital government. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tessa to go over the key dates for the IRDR reporting cycle. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, so I just wanted to quickly go over a few key, key dates you'll need to keep in mind over the next uh, couple of months as you go through this process. Um, you know, last Thursday on the 20th, we opened the Spectrum portal for the IRDR data collection. And of course, today we are providing you an overview of the IRDR. And uh, I do want to let you know that a recording of today's webinar will be posted on YouTube for your reference. So do be on the lookout for that. Um, I would say give us a, a couple of days to put that together, but we will notify you when we get that posted uh, on YouTube. Um, as we get closer to the submission deadline, we will be hosting a couple of drop-in meetings in mid-February and mid-March. And uh, these drop-in meetings will most likely be scheduled for about an hour. And any IRM or, or others that have questions about the IRDR can pop in at any time within that hour to get assistance from us uh, with any questions you guys might have. Um, of course, the uh, March 31st deadline for submission of all IRDR responses from state agencies and uh, the EIR accessibility survey responses for institutions of higher education. And lastly, uh, state agencies that need to complete the information resources corrective action plan must do so by the 31st of May. Uh, so again, those are just a couple of uh, key deadlines to keep in the back of your mind. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So now we'd like to take you through an overview of the different components of the IRDR questionnaire. Let's go to the next slide, please, Mark. Thanks. Uh, so in general, the IRDR is a very broad self-reported questionnaire that covers various topics uh, related to technology and technology practices. The first part of the IRDR focuses on the agency's IT environment. And I do want to point out that institutions of higher education are required to complete section 1.03, which is specifically related to EIR accessibility. Uh, the responses to most questions that were in previous IRDRs are pre-populated. However, there are some new questions that have been added to part one, and I'll go ahead and I'll hand it over to Keith to highlight uh, the sections that include some of those new questions. Sure, thank you, Tessa. I just wanted to uh, point out that uh, the, as the information security landscape uh, has matured quite a bit since the 2020 IRDR, and that's where we would be you know, pre-populating the previous answers from, uh, there are several new or expanded topics in 2022 that you need to be uh, ready to, uh, to answer in greater detail because those won't be uh, uh, pre-populated from last time. Uh, these include areas like uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, incident response, uh, cybersecurity insurance, uh, third-party security, cloud security, uh, and risk management. Uh, 
Um, those areas uh, should be completed with, in consultation with your uh, agency's information security officer. Uh, so just uh, be on the lookout and pay special attention to those, uh, but those areas because they're new. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about part two, the compliance section. Um, and this is a, a required part of the IRDR. And um, it really is referencing the technology related statutes and rules that agencies are required to um, comply with. Um, so it covers security, websites, records management, and more. And for higher education, uh, sections 2.02 and 2.03 are the sections that you're required to complete. Uh, to complete. We did include um, statutory references beginning on page uh, 42 of the instructions that are on our website or that are um, um, that you received in December. Um, for most of the requirements. Uh, well, for all of the requirements, actually, uh, you need to choose the answer that best represents the agency's current compliance status. Um, so there's really just two answers for most questions. Uh, there, there may be a third option for a few, uh, but if you're in compliance on March 31st and you fully implemented that requirement, then you can select in compliance. Um, if you're not in compliance, um, and have not fully implemented that requirement by uh, March 31st of 2022, then um, you need to select uh, not in compliance um, or the third option. Um, the um, agency may be actively working toward compliance, but the place that you'll talk about that is in an IR cap. Um, if you select not into compliance, uh, there will be the opportunity after you submit the entire IRDR to complete IR caps. Um, but again, um, this is really focused on the IT statutes um, and Keith will tell you a little bit more uh, about what to look for in the compliance part of the IRDR. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, you've uh, actually covered it pretty comprehensively, but just to reiterate a couple of things. Uh, statutory requirements, the specific statutory requirements for each of the compliant, uh, compliance questions uh, can be found with those, uh, with those questions uh, in the uh, instruction document and questionnaire. Um, so you should be able to you know, look that up in, uh, in, in you know, detail for exactly what the, the, the state is looking for. Uh, and again, um, think of it in terms of, you, know, you might start working on this next week and it's uh, you know, February, First, think of this uh, questionnaire as a snapshot in time that's March 31st. So if you have plans that are gonna be completed by March 31st, and they are completed by March 31st, you can say you're in compliance. If you've got plans to complete something, but it's gonna be April or May before it's finished, you're not in compliance. So just remember that uh, March 31st is the snapshot date for when you are, um, uh, uh, submitting the, the questionnaire and uh, um, certifying your assessment. Great, thank you so much, Keith. And I just threw a link to the instructions in the chat and the, um, those instructions in that PDF do include links to um, all the statutory requirements for which you will be evaluating compli compliance. Um, let's switch over to the next slide um, and we'll kind of finish up this section about compliance because um, as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, part two, if you select that you're non-compliant, um, an IR cap uh, is required. Now, all of this is is a information resources corrective action plan. So it's a plan and um, the IR cap plan deadline is May 31st. And so really you're just going to be able to um, communicate a time frame for compliance, steps for compliance, if there's any cost, um, priority, any supporting attachments. And this is a good tool to use uh, for communication uh, with your uh, leadership. Um, and also it is um, something that DIR uh, communicates to the state legislature. So next slide, please. 
I'm going to turn it over to Tessa now to talk a little more about part three. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, so the third part of the IRDR focuses on strategic alignment. And in this section, we ask agencies about how their IT initiatives are aligning with the high level statewide technology goals and objectives that are addressed in the current state strategic plan. And the most recent state strategic plan, the 2022-2026 state st strategic plan uh, was published in November of uh, last year. And you can find a copy of it on our website at the link that you see here on the slide. Uh, part three also asks agencies to identify the amount of progress made on prior statewide technology goals. And these would be the technology goals that were outlined in the previous state strategic plan. And that one would be the uh, 2020 to 2024 state strategic plan. Next slide, please. So let's talk a bit about the uh, IT inventory itself. And uh, I'm gonna throw a lot of stuff at you here over the next couple of slides, but uh, be aware that uh, there's gonna be a, a demo um, uh, shortly after this uh, slide presentation and uh, all will become clear uh, when, you, uh, when you get a chance to take a look at that, uh, the information that I'm giving you. Um, the uh, Texas uh, Government Code sections 2054 there, uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the requirements that are laid out there are that uh, you have to submit an inventory of servers, mainframes, cloud services, information technology equipment, um, which is you know, pretty broad. Um, IHEs, uh, that is uh, institutions of higher education, please consider, strongly consider uh, participating in the inventory. Um, it uh, helps the, uh, the state um, with uh, predictions, with uh, needs, with identifying impacts and vulnerabilities. Um, and so it's, uh, it's just fantastic goodness that's available for you to take advantage of, even though you are not required to by statute. Um, in Spectrum, in the inventory, you'll uh, find that the inventory is broken up into devices and applications. We'll go into a little more detail in that in just a moment. And uh, again, as was mentioned up at the top of the, uh, the introduction, um, we have pre-populated everything that we have from uh, other sources, the CMDB uh, in service now, and uh, any answers that you've provided us in prior HR, uh, excuse me, IRDRs. Uh, next slide, please. So just a word about sensitive and confidential information that you are going to um, provide in the IRDR. Um, as you know, uh, Texas is um, subject to, you know, any document in Texas uh, by the, that's owned by the state, subject to open records. Um, we will be publishing or responding to uh, Open Records Act requests uh, if anybody wants the, uh, the IRDR information. However, there is an, uh, an exemption for security related information um, that is that we will be scrubbing out uh, any of that data um, from any of uh, any of the fields that uh, that we you know, expect to find any possible um, system compromising information. So having said that, you still need to be careful about uh, putting any system compromising information, any you know, specific security related information in open text fields in the general questionnaire portion of the uh, IRDR. Um, try not to do that. Uh, we'll catch it if we can, but we might not catch it. Uh, so just be aware to recap, open record laws are a thing. Uh, DIR will do the very best to scrub any uh, security related information, um, but still do your best to be careful, particularly in open text fields. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, devices, let's talk about devices for a moment. Um, generally, you're gonna be asked to provide, uh, you know, required fields such as asset name, asset type, organization, uh, device status, all of that stuff that, uh, that you would expect, but then there are also many more fields uh, that might not be applicable to a particular asset type, that 
uh, you know, something like, uh, um, you know, number of uh, processors in a server, for example. Uh, you're not going to have that for, for other types of asset. Um, required fields will all be marked. So, uh, you know, very clearly you'll know, you know, for each uh, uh, asset type exactly the information that you need. And although it's not required, it's important to associate devices with applications uh, to aid in the identification of uh, impacts and vulnerabilities uh, going forward. Um, again, just uh, to reiterate that uh, IHEs are not required to do this inventory uh, or associate devices to applications, um, but it would be uh, extremely helpful uh, to do so for yourself and for the state to uh, serve as a central repository, manage technology inventory needs, and uh, aid in identifying impacts uh, as just discussed. Um, there is a supplemental instruction document. Um, it's an addition uh, with more details to the IRDR instructions that you find out on the webpage that uh, uh, which was just linked to in the chat by uh, Elizabeth. Um, that supplementary for the uh, instructions for the inventory goes into more detail about specifically how to answer, uh, you know, fill out these forms. A couple of different methods for getting your inventory in. Let's see. Great. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, let's talk a little bit about the applications part of the inventory. Um, so there's an applications inventory in Spectrum, and it's a repository of all the business applications used by an organization for your business operations. Um, examples are like a payment intake system or a customer information system. Um, you can use uh, this uh, application inventory to do everything from tracking risk or business impact um, mapping uh, related software to business processes and the uh, devices, um, as Keith mentioned, the associated devices. Uh, but really, there's uh, some minimal requirements in the IRDR related to uh, validating the ac accuracy of the business applications listed in um, Spectrum. Um, so there's a few fields, name, whether it's in scope for an APM, um, whether you want to generate a new assessment, um, who an application owner is, and the mission criticality of that application or some of the required fields. They're designated with an asterisk, and when Rain does the demo later, uh, you'll be able to see um, how you can determine which are the required fields. Um, a current and accurate APM assessment is required for the prioritization of cybersecurity and legacy systems questionnaire, which is um, kind of that precursor uh, for uh, certain items in the LAR. Um, agencies can uh, review their previous um, APM assessments um, and uh, there will be more information um, when we provide uh, the demo. Next slide, please. And so the last step is to confirm the inventory is correct. And there's uh, two attestation boxes, um, one for the device inventory and one for the um, application inventory. And so that will be uh, the final part of submitting um, the IRDR and um, until those attestations are complete, um, your IRDR is not considered complete. Um, let's stop for a minute and see if there are any um, questions just about the questionnaire, and then we'll uh, launch into uh, the demonstration of the Spectrum Collection tool. Um, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A, and we'll see if we can get you some answers. Um, I see there is a question about uh, whether uh, the IR cap, if we choose non-compliance, is it prior to the March 31 submission or the 531 submission? And so um, in the IRDR, you're going to, in that section two, select either compliant or non-compliant uh, as of March 31st. 
after you submit the IRDR, you will be able to launch an IR cap or corrective action plan and complete those sections for the non-compliant items. And um, I see that somebody, Keith, did you have something to add to this? I did. Uh, thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you. I uh, had just uh, one more note about the inventory that uh, that I, I forgot to mention. And uh, I think it's important to, uh, to just put it out there. Uh, we've mentioned a couple of times uh, during the presentation so far that we're going to be pre-populating data in the IRDR from, among other sources, the CMDB uh, repository in ServiceNow. Um, this is, you know, everything that you uh, have entered or, or it, your, your inventory that's being managed by uh, DCS or, you know, what we now call the Texas private cloud. And it's important to note that uh, while we are importing that information into uh, Spectrum to uh, help you, you know, aid with the, uh, the IRDR, um, we don't have a programmatic, programmatic way to uh, export that data back out to CMDB if you've made any changes in it. Uh, so in other words, as you're going through and doing the inventory, you've got uh, anything that came from DCS is pre-populated. If you notice that any of those th any of that information is uh, incorrect, please make a note, uh, fill out the service request uh, in the portal to make an update to CMDB, pour all those things in there, any changes that you made in the IRDR. And that way, as we go forward, uh, after the IRDR exercise is completed for this year, we will have captured those updates and corrections uh, in what will be the ongoing uh, you know, source of truth, which is the CMDB. Uh, for any of those, uh, you know, DCS uh, controlled um, systems. Thank you. I just wanted to throw that out. No, th thanks for the additional information. Um, we have two more questions in the Q and A panel. Uh, one is uh, if some of our business applications are in devices that belong to another agency and thus that device is reported by that agency, do we still report the device in our IRDR? I'll see if uh, Keith or maybe Matt Kelly um, wants to answer that. Hey, this is Matt. I would, uh, I would encourage you to log your applications and information systems that you as an agency leverage, regardless of if you own them or not. Even in this case, it sounds like it's more of a third party relationship to another agency's application. Um, it's up to you really whether or not that you want to assess it. Um, since you're not the actual owner of the application, uh, it would ne not necessarily be required to do so, particularly with the devices. That would be the responsibility of the agency that operates and owns that application. But it's just generally good practice to understand the applications that are in use by your agency or where your agency data may actually reside. Uh, so it's it's more of a preferential thing on your end, but it's the agency that owns and develops and uh, operates that application's responsibility to log that information. Thank you, Matt. And the last question may have been answered um, when Keith was talking about. Um, CMDB, um, but the question is, uh, if there are a lot of new apps or changes to existing ones, can the changes for that app be imported back into the tool? And I'm assuming this is a question about the import uh, from uh, ServiceNow for data service center um, agencies. Yeah, and unfortunately, the answer is not at this time. We don't have any way to capture the changes that were made to DCS owned systems uh, specifically to take those out and put them and do like a bulk, you know, mass update to, uh, to CMDB. Uh, we are working on that, but it's just not gonna be ready for this year's uh, IRDR. Um, so that's why we're asking, we're, we're, you know, making a note while you're, you know, going through when you catch those changes to, uh, to systems that were in CMDB, uh, you know, please just highlight those and then sit up, submit a request through the portal uh, to get those records. Thank you. 
Um, to make sure that we have plenty of time for the demonstration, we're going to go ahead and move on to that, and we'll uh, try to answer additional questions just by typing the answer in the uh, Q&A. So we're going to turn it over to Rain to give us a demo of the Spectrum system. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mark, if you could go to the next slide, I'd just like to cover a couple reminders with the Spectrum tool. Uh, as you're using the portal, please know that any web browser may be used. We recommend Chrome or Edge or other Chromium-based browsers, but Firefox um, and Safari also work. Uh, please do not use the browser's back button. If you need to return to your previous page, there should be an X um, circle in the top right corner that you can use, and that will return you to your previous page. Uh, notifications, and this is extremely pertinent to the password reset functionality, will not send for any act, inactive accounts. So act, accounts are rendered inactive after 60 days of no login. So if you are requesting a password reset and have not received one, or if you have delegated the IRDR to someone else and they have not received the notification, it is safe to assume that their account is inactive. Um, and you can contact either of these emails to have that account re um, reactivated. At any point, you can open support requests in the portal from any of your dashboards, and I'll show that in a demo in a moment. Um, if you don't find a user in an assignment box, so for either the delegate functions or reviewer, if you cannot find the user, there's a chance, there's a decent chance that they don't have an account. In that case, again, you can open a support request or email either of those um, email addresses provided above, and we can get them set up with appropriate access. Uh, throughout the IRDR, there are hyperlinks to the Texas government code, and to open those hyperlinks, use control and click to open those in a new tab. And then lastly, save often. Uh, this, does, this portal does not have auto save functionality, so just ensure that you're saving to make sure that your work is tracked. So with that, I'll dive into the Spectrum tool. Okay, so upon logging in, anyone with the IRM group um, should be granted at, with their home dashboard as the Information Resources Manager home screen. At this point, you can see the current IRDR and some other information directly related to your role like APM, uh, previous PCLS requests, your devices, thing, things in that vein. As I mentioned before, across the portal, you can open support requests using the quick links at the top of the screen. So anywhere in any of these workspaces, you should see a support request link that you can click and request account activations, um, any system functionality questions, or any other things related to Spectrum. Again, you can always contact GRC or uh, via the email as well, or if it's IRDR specific, you can email IRDR at dir.texas.gov. So again, this closed functionality in the top corner will return you to your previous screen. Now, if you're looking for more information related to IRDR specifically, we have an IRDR dashboard as well. Across the top of your screen, you may see many different workspaces depending on your access and what is applicable to your role. You cannot see the IRDR IR cap workspace, click the three ellipses and it should be in this um, drop down here. At this point, you'll see more information related to IRDR specifically including accessing previous records, accessing the IRDR website and instructions, um, accessing your devices and applications as well. So to view previous IRDR records, you can click this link here, and this will bring you to your previously submitted requests from 2018, 2020, and 2022. If I view a 2020 record, I know that we've gotten requests about submitting pre or viewing previous responses and also exporting those. To do that, you can click this export in the top right-hand corner and choose which um, mode you would like this to be exported to. Now, to complete the 2022 IRDR, you can access it here or again via any 
your home dashboard or the IRDR dashboard. Here, it's right below the instructions and you can click the hyperlink under the question ID. In the IRDR, you'll see that you have multiple progress indicators to determine where you are with your completion of the IRDR. You can also expand this for a detailed progress based on each different section. So here you can see I've completed mul multiple or almost all of the sections, but I have a couple more to complete. Once all of these check marks are, once all of these are green checks, you'll be able to submit the IRDR. IHEs, please note that this may not be accurate as you are not required to submit all for sections of the IRDR. So for IHEs, please just pay attention to the part one to progress up here. To delegate the IRDR, we know that it's a very comprehensive um, questionnaire and it requires a lot of input from the business. So you can add additional assignees here in this delegated option. Those assignees will receive an email notification that they've been added to the IRDR and can log in and update responses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one change from previous years that I think is very important to call out is access to the IRDR. Uh, in previous years, we required that the IRM logs in and delegates to other people. And by default, the IRM was the only person who could actually edit the IRDR. We understand that I IRMs are really busy and we've determined that instead of requiring that the IRM logs in, um, we are now also allowing any other user who the IRM has requested that they are in the IRM group. Typically that includes the ISO or other um, IT managers in the agency that they can already edit the IRDR. So that does not require that the IRM logs in and delegates that they can already log in and update the questionnaire. So this delegated to function is more for notification and for people who are just general access in Spectrum. Similar to previous years, you can provide a reviewer. This is an optional item, but we would recommend that if you have someone that you've delegated all of the IR, IRDR submission to, that the IRM is named as the reviewer to do a final check before submission. So here we'll see that I can't submit this yet because I'm not done all of the section review. So I'll expand each section and see which responses are populated. Uh, for most users, that that's about 40% of the questions because of their previous uh, submissions from 2020. Please do still confirm that those submissions from 2020 are accurate. Uh, we have pre-populated it for ease of use, but you still expect that they are validated responses. So I'll, I'll keep refer, responding to a couple of these questions, ensure that everything's been completed. You can see here that in the IRDR, we sometimes have dependent questions and depending on the selection you choose, it will display more or additional questions. So at this point, I think I've completed everything in section one. To check my progress, I'll save the record and I can see the detailed section progress and these indicators will turn into a check mark. At this point, I'll do the same thing for the compliance section. and section 2.01 was the only thing I hadn't completed. Saving the record again, I'll see that that has turned into a check. If there's anything within the portal that you want to make a note of, you can click the sticky note on the right side to provide comments about the reason for not being in compliance. Once a comment has been provided, the sticky note will turn into a darker orange yellow color. So the last thing that I need to complete here is the IT inventory. So each inventory is populated from previous response 
um, your previously submitted responses in 2020 and also at, um, at a future date we'll be bringing in the current information from the CMDB. Uh, we anticipate that in the next week or so. So I will expand each of these sections and here I'll view all devices that are active in Spectrum at this date. Um, to add a new device, I can click this hyperlink to bring up a new device record. So at this point, I'll provide information about the device. In this case, you can see here the asterisk items are required fields. And we're asking that you provide things like the description, um, the capability of the device, deployment year, um, it's the deployment role, things like that. Um, depending on the device and asset type, some things will be more applicable than others. And then I'll save and return. So to edit existing records and see all devices that have been added, you'll click this display report. This is different from previous years because we wanted to provide more options and flexibility for the agencies to edit in an inline view. So this display report will bring up an entire um, link of all of your active assets. And you can see here that you can edit them in line. So if I determine that this device has been retired, I can change that in line. Across the side, I can save this. If there are additional columns and fields that you would like to be added, you can click this manage columns option. Here you can add any additional fields from the devices table to view and see what's been provided there. I would also like to call out that you can filter on this right hand column. So here I can filter to view only my servers or databases. I can view only production assets, things like that. Um, as a note, the DCS information will be updated again at a future date. So you may want to elect to sort and filter for only your organization supplied devices. To view the full device record, you can click in on the hyperlink. And this will bring up the full view of the device record where you can update in more of a record edited view. So returning to the IRDR, or return to the IT inventory, um, one additional item that I would like to call out is once you click that display report, you can also export this via that export at the top of the screen. So if you would like to view this in Excel um, for organizations that have thousands of assets, that may be an easier view. Um, and in that case, you can click the export and view it in Excel. Once I validated that all of the asset, all the device assets that I have are up to date, accurate, and have been added into Spectrum, I'll expand the attestation portion and click confirm. Now the same process applies to the application inventory. So at this point, I can expand the application inventory and expand the applications tab and the same type of um, report object appears. Again, I can click the add new to add a new application or I can click display report to view all of the current applications in Spectrum. Here I can update the uh, basic information about the application, validate if it is in scope for APM, 
provide the APM coordinator, and also view the most recent APM start date. So this is an um, important note, note to be made that any new application since 2020 should have an APM assessment conducted, or for applications that have not been assessed in the past four years, but will be utilized in your organization's PCLS request later this year, um, they should have a new APM assessment conducted. In that case, you'll make sure that the APM coordinator is assigned and you can change this field to generate new APM assessment. So upon saying yes, and all of the information being provided, a new APM assessment will be created and your, that APM coordinator will be notified. Similar to devices, I can also click into the application name itself and view the application information in a full report view. So here I can see the required fields and things that need to be completed before an APM assessment will be launched. In this case, there's a check and everything is good to go. So now that I've said yes to generate, a new APM assessment will be created. If I need to retire any devices, I can do that here by changing the device status to inactive. And then clicking the save on the right side. I'll return to the IRDR. And now that I validated that all of my applications, devices, and responses are correct, I'll confirm here. I'll save the record so that this progress indicator becomes a check mark. And I can finally submit the APM or submit the IRDR. Again, a reviewer is optional. So if you provide a reviewer, it will go to the reviewer before um, officially being submitted to DIR. At this point, once the APM or IRDR is fully submitted to DIR, the IR caps will be generated. IR caps will typically be generated in the next day. Um, so upon logging in, and I'll switch to my other screen here. Upon logging in, you'll be able to view your IR caps. Again, in this IRDR IR cap workspace, I can see the general IRDR dashboard, but I can change to the IR cap dashboard. This provides a view directly into current IR caps. Here I can see everything that are my current IR caps. Again, if you have not yet submitted your IRDR, um, you may only see the 2020 IR caps that are still um, in pro process because we do understand that an IR cap may take more than a year or two to implement. So here I'll drill into an IR cap and to, to submit the IR cap, I will provide the priority, um, estimated start and completion date, the steps to compliance. Um, I can also delegate this to someone else and provide a reviewer for the sake of time. I will not, again, there are optional fields, but they can be provided. Um, once you've provided the steps to compliance, the estimated start and completion date, you can submit the plan. At this point, it will either go to a waiting review or it will go to in process. So at this point, the IR cap may be sitting for a little while as your agency works and strives towards completion. Once the IR cap is completed, and this may be in, in some time, um, you'll log back in and provide the actual start and actual completion date and mark the IR cap as in compliance using the actions drop down, And then the IR cap will be closed. Again, this may take some time. So the, the requirement by the statutory deadline is to submit the IR cap by May 31st. It does not need to be completed by May 31st. Now, I know we're getting some questions in the chat so and the Q&A, so I'm going to um, return to that and see if there's anything I can answer here. Rain, would you like uh, for me to read a couple of the questions? Yeah, uh, that'd be great. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Um, it looks like there are a few questions that are related to uh, delegation. 
One is um, how to add someone to the list. Another question is, um, is the delegation for each section? And then um, I think just restating uh, what can be done for adding an agency staff to update and yeah. through the delegation function. Yep, so if you click the delegation function and you search the user's name and they do not exist, um, I've already submitted my R IR cap, so I cannot edit it without contacting DIR to have it unlocked. So I can't do that right now. Um, but if you click the, I the delegate function and it does not appear that the user that you're looking for is there, um, return to your dashboard and click the support request. And here you can, you'll choose your organization and you'll provide the request type of account activation. Uh, provide the user's first and last name, email address, um, their access required, typically general user, potentially IRM, um, and fill that information out and click the ready to submit and we'll get their account created and delegated. Um, the delegation is on a full, it is for all of IRDR, but the IR cap delegation is per IR cap. So um, if you delegate, they will be able to answer any questions in the IRDR. So it's a communication thing where um, you'll have to communicate to them which sections they need to complete. Um, permission level required to view IRDR panel. Um, they will, the IRM group is by default able to edit the IRDR. Um, the general user can view, but will not be able to edit unless they have been delegated to the IRDR. The save function is for an individual page. So, the, um, so that's for each page, not all of Spectrum. Um, you should receive a prompt when you're exiting a record that you've been editing but have not saved to confirm if you want to continue and clear your unsafe changes. Thank you so much, Rain. I think we are just about out of time. There are a couple of questions left that we'll uh, go ahead and try to answer um, offline, but I do wanna uh, make sure that we close out this uh, webinar um, on time. And um, I think we have a, a resource slide that we need to make sure that you uh, can get a hold of us that Mark will show and Tessa can just really quickly cover the resources that are available for additional questions and assistance. Great, thanks Elizabeth. So for any uh, particular questions about the IRDR content itself, you need some clarification on a question, you uh, have some questions about the process, you can email those questions to irdr at dir.texas.gov. And for support with the Spectrum portal, you need to have a password reset, you need some help with obtaining credentials, you can uh, send an email to grc at dir.texas.gov for help with that. And I believe uh, that is the end of our presentation. We appreciate everybody um, coming to join us today, and I hope we've answered uh, any questions that you have. But again, certainly if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. And again, just want to remind you that we are going to be posting this uh, presentation up on YouTube in the next few days, and we will send out a notification once that is up. Thanks, everyone.